Hey, it's an honor to be with you from Colorado. Thank you so much for the invitation, Brian and the team, the volunteers to pull this together. Thank you so very much. They've done a great job, haven't they? Yeah. All right, uh, it's not gonna surprise many of you in this audience that what the larger political, media, and academic culture have been pushing on society has been a massive failure disguised in government programs that promise to improve the lives of children, women, men, and society. In reality, these plans, proposals, and programs have profoundly denigrated the family. In fact, Boise State political science professor Scott Yenner, in his book, The Recovery of Family Life, Exposing the Limits of Modern Ideologies, calls what has been happening to the family a rolling revolution. It's been a calculated, deliberate attack upon the defining ideals of family that rolls systemically from objective to objective, agenda to agenda. Now let's be clear, no one really disputes this. It's happening. We are only debating whether this revolution has been healthy or unhealthy, good or bad. And one's answer largely depends on their perspective on the nature and reality of what T.S. Eliot called the permanent things. Let's never lose sight of an important fact. Those pushing this rolling revolution have long wanted three things. One, divorce sex from marriage, procreation, and parenting. Two, fundamentally redefine marriage and the reality of male and female. We're seeing this right now in our culture fully celebrate each and every new form of alternative family and identity. These three objectives are causing great harm to those who are most vulnerable. The social science collected over the last 50 years is irrefutable on that point, and most of you know it all too well. As we survey this research, it is nearly impossible to find one significant measure of human well-being that the rolling revolution to dismantle the family has improved. Some might say it has improved the lot of women, but is that really true in terms of what matters most? Let me give you just one example from the scholarship. Let's look at declining female happiness. In 2009, two scholars from the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania published their findings with the influential National Bureau of Economic Research. The title of their paper, The Paradox of Declining Female Happiness. The scholars explain that up until the 1970s, women had traditionally reported higher levels of life satisfaction and happiness compared to men. But they lament that has changed, and substantially so. These scholars explain, we will show in this paper that women's happiness has fallen both absolutely and relative to men's in a pervasive way. These scholars can only guess at what is driving this notable declining happiness in women. They offer a number of hypotheses, but the final one they offer, I want to read it to you exactly as they wrote it. They said, finally, the changes brought about through the women's movement may have decreased women's happiness. The lead author of this study is a woman, her name is Betsy Stevenson, a Wellesley grad. She served on President Obama's Council of Economic Advisors for several years. The point is, this woman is not a conservative, and it was feminist Diana Pierce, a scholar directing the Center for Women's Welfare, at the University of Washington, who coined the important term, the feminization of poverty in 1978 in a paper on how women were faring under the advances of the women's movement. Her opening line stated, poverty is rapidly becoming a female problem. Why? Pierce explained that for many, the price of women's independence has become their pauperization and dependence on welfare. Think of that, dependence on welfare. 
Keep in mind it was Democrats, progressives, pointing out this fact. But this failure to improve real human well-being and happiness is what happens when a culture separates out the essential triangle of marriage, sex, and procreation, and there is nothing progressive nor compassionate about causing increased suffering. At Focus on the Family, we hear from hundreds of people every week, every week, who are suffering deeply from what culture is intentionally doing to the ideal of the family. The stories are increasingly heartbreaking and takes all of this out of the theoretical and puts it right into the day-to-day -day practical. For a society that says it is so deeply concerned for social justice, it certainly is pushing an agenda that is doing profound damage to the most vulnerable. Family restoration is the greatest social justice work that can be done. And I want to demonstrate how academics from the left have told us as much. It's a great irony in a story the popular press and the left-wing politicians don't want to talk about. While it is radical liberals prescribing and pushing the rolling revolution, it is ironically center-left scholars who are telling us through their important and careful scholarship that the revolution is a deeply harmful failure, just like we saw on the declining happiness of women. They say, the left tells us why the natural family matters if we listen to them carefully. Let me start with the UN Conference on the Rights of the Child. It is a troubling document that Focus on the Family and many in this audience have long resisted. But we should all note something. Article 7 declares perhaps the most conservative statement about human rights and experiencing that human right that can be uttered. It says, the child shall, as far as possible, have the right to know and be cared for by his or her parents. Now, this is before the term parents was redefined to mean some loving adult. It means mother and father. That's what the UN is saying. Now, I suspect almost everyone in this audience is familiar with the Moynihan Report from the United States. In this U.S. moderate debate, modern debate on how the breakdown of the family is hurting the most vulnerable, started with Democrats in the Johnson administration in the mid-1960s. That's when Daniel Patrick Moynihan, who went on to become a great senator of New York, was Assistant Secretary of Labor under President Johnson. He wrote a groundbreaking academic report on the state of the black family in America. He said, blacks in America will never achieve their full dreams as citizens if we ignore the tragic decline of the black family. He called it literally a case for national action. The first page of this report said this, and I want to put it on the screen. The fundamental problem in which this is most clearly the case is that of family structure. The evidence, not final, but powerfully persuasive, is that the Negro family in the urban ghettos is crumbling. So long as this situation persists, the cycle of poverty and disadvantage will continue to repeat itself. Have you ever heard anything more conservative? But saying such things in 1965 was controversial even then. In fact, Moynihan said, if my head were sticking on a pike at the southwest gate of the White House grounds, the impression of disdain toward me would hardly be greater. This was the start of the modern public debate on the importance of family, health, and formation. This law was, or this uh, speech was given in 1965 from a former Democrat, and it was divisive. But let's move forward a little bit to another politician who served in the White House under President George H.W. Bush, Vice President Dan Quayle. He once gave an equally vilified talk about the dangers and downsides of well-educated, financially independent women choosing to have babies without husbands. Mr. Quayle's public roasting was worse than Monaghan's, but it was a liberal-leaning Democrat social researcher who came to his defense. That was Barbara Defoe Whitehead, who wrote the most widely circulated and reprinted article in the Atlantic's 160-year history entitled, Dan Quayle Was Right. 
It was 1993 and Ms. Whitehead explained, children in single parent families are six times as likely to be poor. They are also likely to stay poor longer. 22% of children in one parent families will experience poverty during childhood for seven years or more, as compared with only 2% of children in the two parent family. Of course, these realities continue today. In fact, they've gotten worse. Curiously, Barbara Defoe Whitehead was perhaps the first person to say this on a national stage who wasn't viciously attacked. This is because the message was precisely on par with some important scholars doing groundbreaking research for a JFK-like governor known as Bill Clinton. In his run-up to the presidency in early the 1990s, Clinton collected a group of formidable social scientists to develop policy measures for him. Two of these, Bill Galston, who became Bill Clinton's White House domestic policy advisor, and Elaine Kamarak, made some of the most important and foundational statements about the importance of the married two-parent family that have ever been uttered. They sounded as if they were pro-family conservatives, but they were liberal Democrats doing good and honest social science. We quoted their work quite often at Focus on the Family. Let me offer some examples of what Galston and Kamarak wrote in an important white paper for the Progressive Policy Institute. It is no exaggeration to say that a stable two-parent family is, an American, is in an American child's uh, best interest or best protection against poverty. Sharply rising rates of divorce, unwed mothers, and runaway fathers do not represent alternative lifestyles. They are rather patterns of adult behavior with profoundly negative consequences for children. That is a good statement. Families have primary responsibility for instilling traits such as discipline, ambition, respect for the law, and respect for others. A responsibility that cannot be discharged as effectively by auxiliary social institutions such as public schools. These were not conservative right-wingers. These are left-center people. Another important scholar from this group, Isabel Sawhill, is a relentless advocate for child well-being and a colleague and close friend of Galston's at the center left Brookings Institute. She made this bold statement some years ago. The proliferation of single parent households accounts for virtually all of the increase in child poverty since the 1970s. Wow. However, the unchallenged dean of soci sociologists studying how the family revolution has impacted women and children is Princeton University's Sarah McClanahan, who sadly passed away last year. She's responsible for the $17 million Fragile Families and Child Wellbeing Study, a monumental joint project between Princeton University and Columbia. In a well-known and often repeated quote, McClanahan wrote in 1994, if we were asked to design a system for making sure that children's basic needs were met, we would probably come up with something quite similar to the two-parent family ideal. Such a design would not only ensure that children had access to the time and money of two adults, it would also provide a system of checks and balances to promote quality parenting. The fact that both have a biological, biological connection to the child would increase the likelihood that parents would identify with the child and be willing to sacrifice for that child, and it would reduce the likelihood that neither parent would abuse the child. While we recognize that two-parent families frequently do not live up to this ideal in all respects, nevertheless, we would expect children who grow up in two-parent families to be doing better, on average, than children who grow up with only one parent. McClanahan demonstrated how <clears throat> married mothers and fathers provide countless and unexpected benefits for children parents, and society. It would not be unfair to say no one holds a candle to her. Let us fast forward to the 2000s and the work of scholars at the Urban Institute, demonstrating the power of marriage among low-income minority communities. In a collection of four important white papers, American University economist Robert Learman, concentrating on low-income populations, explains from his findings, Married couples have incomes nearly four times their basic needs, a ratio that is 30 to 70% higher than what 
cohabiting couples experience and 63 to 113% higher than what single parents with another living adult, such as a sibling, a friend, or a mother experience. So it is marriage and not just the presence of another adult helping hands that really produce a family. Additionally, Learman concluded, the results re reveal that marriage significantly and substantially reduces the likelihood of poverty, holding constant for family background, race, and ethnicity, age, and education. Being married reduces poverty by two-thirds. And it was Jonathan Rausch, a center-left journalist writing for the National Journal, now at the Brookings Institution, who noted that the growing class divide in America and elsewhere was not so much due to education, race, or ethnicity, but actually marriage. Rausch said that those who are married, regardless of education, race, and other socioeconomic factors, were doing well in society, moving up the ladder. Those who did not, as a group, declined, the unmarried. In his brief and game-changing essay entitled The Widening Marriage Gap, Rausch colorf colorfully put it this way, poverty correlates more strongly with a family's marital status than with its race. According to Census Bureau data, a two-parent black household is more likely to be poor than is a two-parent white household, but both are far less likely to be poor than a mother-only household of either race. In other words, if you're a baby about to be born, your best odds are to choose married black parents over unmarried white parents. An increasingly post-marriage culture is further demonstrating the clear dividing line between the haves and the have-nots. It's marriage. Sarah McClanahan, McClanahan famously said, marriage was the primary factor for the diverging destinies of those who were advancing in society and those who were falling behind. It's marriage. To stress again, it was progressives who were saying it perhaps better than anyone. So let's jump to the present. Let's talk about today briefly. Just last month, Professor Melissa Kearney, a University of Maryland economist, research associate at the prestigious National Bureau of Economic Research and senior fellow at Brookings, published a very important economics paper. Kearney demonstrates in her new paper how the lower middle class family has all but collapsed. Little has changed in the family makeup of the poor and the well-to-do. Marriage is very rare amongst the first, but is, the, is strong for the latter. So where's the decline happening most? Among the middle class. They are mimicking the poor and more and more in marital, marital decline. But this is not because their marriages are failing. It's because they're not being formed in the first place. Across the population, Kearney explains, the most recent decline in the share of children living in married parent homes primarily reflects an increase in non-marital childbearing, not a rise in divorce rates. Specifically, she shows, in 1980, only 22% of single mothers were never married, while 64% were divorced. Today, 52% of single mothers were never married and only 39% were divorced. For men in 2005, 50% of men ages 24 to 34 were married. In 2020, it had fallen to only 35%. It's increasingly the case that marriage is not being tried and failing, but not being tried at all. This is problematic for children as even failed marriages can provide benefits in contrast to those in never married households. Children who have a divorced father in their life are shown to do much better on a variety of measures than their peers with an absent father. Dr. Kearney shows this is happening most predominantly among high school graduates and non-graduates. The family divide between marriage and non-marriage is becoming an education divide, and this is a new disturbing phenomenon. The only place where divorce remains the primary driver of single parenthood is among the college educated, a group that already is well equipped to manage those storms. Kearney explained, 
The share of children living with an unparented mother is more than two times as high among children whose mothers have a high school degree than it is among children whose mothers have a four-year college degree. As a result, she concludes, the steep decline in the share of children living with married parents, or more generally with two parents, has happened largely outside of the college-educated ed class. Professor Kearney mourns the shift as she admits the essential contribution married mothers and fathers make to children and society well-being. She said, the evidence suggesting that children do better when they live in a home with both mother and father present, especially boys, suggests that improving children's outcomes and closing class gaps and outcomes between the children of college, educated parents and others will require confronting the multi-dimensional challenges facing non-college adults, especially men that have led to the erosion of marriage and the two-parent family among wide swaths of the population. She goes on to say this, in short, here's the truth. When it comes to progressive elites, do as they do, not as they say. Actually, I'm saying that. This means two important points. First, the poor and less educated are doubly disadvantaged by the family formation choice, choices they are increasingly making away from marriage. Second, college educated elites are actually less likely to follow the relativistic rhetoric of love makes a family. Elite classes are far more likely to be more married minded in their actual actions while celebrating family diversity in their rhetoric. As our friend, uh, University of Virginia sociologist Brad Wilcox, who has spoken here many times, wrote in the Wall Street Journal a couple of years ago, next time you hear a college educated academic or advocate undercut married motherhood and fatherhood as the foundation of family, do as they do, not as they say. Likewise, my conclusion, the rolling revolution of family redefinition being pushed and celebrated by elite and radical voices on the left has proven alarmingly harmful in nearly every way by leading liberal-leaning scholars. Now, let me end with an extremely present quote from G.K. Chesterton in The Superstition of Divorce. This triangle of truisms of father, mother, and child cannot be destroyed. It can only destroy those civilizations which disregard it. Thank you very much.